All right. Evening, everyone. You can be seated. I guess I should say surprise. <laughs> David got a little darker for this class here. Uh, all that sunlight. No, uh, David had some pressing issues, and uh, um, I will be taking this class for this evening. Seems like I just saw you guys not that long ago. But um, I'm glad that you're all able to make it back yet once again for another class as we continue forward, uh, moving forward in the Peaceful Solution Character Education Teacher Certification course. Um, we are in unit number four, which is the respect unit. And um, if you were able to watch um, uh, the previous class uh, with David, you will saw, see that he was pretty much summing up uh, the previous chapter, which is chapter one, so we're kind of moving out of chapter one, as my um, first slide shows there. Uh, we're moving out of chapter one into uh, chapter two, which is uh, respect for myself. All right, and um, if you were here for the previous class, you know, like 10 or 11 points here, um, under the page of what I have learned on page 21, uh, you know, of course, David did a great job going back over and rehearsing that information. And I would encourage you as a, as a teacher, um, and, and this is really, <clears throat> I mean, you don't really have to kind of think outside the box with this, because as you'll notice when we move forward into the next lesson, we always have a little bit of a review from the previous lesson to gently guide us. Remember, that's a part of what the how the peaceful solution is laid, to gently guide the student from one lesson to another. But as a teacher, going back over and kind of rehearsing the previous lesson and what I have learned, it'll give you kind of some, some key points uh, to look for as we uh, progress into the next lesson. So we covered that on page 21 for the last class. Um, if you go back to page 21, I just wanted to read that, that comment in that box there. You see the little construction guy there off to the left <clears throat> on page 21. It says, choose to be a part of the construction crew that builds respect, not a part of the disrespectful demolition derby that tears you and others down. And the key word there is the very first word in that sentence is choose. Now we covered this uh, over and over uh, throughout, well, <laughs> the first three chapters, or the first three units, not chapters, the first three units that we went into, uh, character acceptance and respect, and showed the, the, the power and the ability that everyone has in that is the ability to make a choice. Now, in order for a person to be able to make a right choice, in order for a person to be able to distinguish between right and wrong, in order for a person to be able to make an educated decision, they have to have the facts. They have to be educated. They have to be taught in some way, shape, or form, whether they opened up a book and read it, whether they saw it on a uh, you know, a news broadcast or in the newspaper or whether it was taught to them in uh, in the school setting or at home by a parent, a teacher, guardian, uh, whatever the case might be. But in order for people to be able to choose or to make a choice, and of course that is one of the ultimate goals of the Peaceful Solution is to get uh, our students, young men, old men, young women, old women, whoever it might be, get our students to be able to recognize the influences, to be able to recognize the the environment that they might be in to be able to recognize when something is positive and negative and to understand how that will affect them and others if they choose to allow themselves to be influenced into behaving in a way that brings about harm to themselves, others, and the environment, as well as the opposite, right? Because we talked about goal setting, we talked about uh, understanding a person's purpose and objective. All these things are important. They play a key Part in the development of a positive character, but of course, you can't just expect a child or even an adult for that matter to even know these things. I mean, these things have to be instilled within a person's mind. You know, somebody said, you know, when's the best time to start training a person uh, in positive character development, positive character education? Well, the best time is right now. You know, it's wherever you are, right here, right now. We can't go back 10, 15, 20, 30 years and start training somebody over again and getting them to unlearn certain things and to relearn the proper things, no, you can't do that. It's not possible. If we had a reset button, I think that thing would probably get wore out because people would be resetting it over and over and over and over and over again, uh, doing things over in their life. But the fact is, 
those experiences that we have had in life, they help, they are a part, they are a part of the factors that help, as we learned in the the character unit, they are some of the factors uh, that help to make up our character, who we are. Those experiences make us and shape us into the individuals that we are today. Now, does that mean that everybody's, you know, 100% Uh, totally uh, a great person, you know, with no flaws or 100% a totally bad person with with no positive traits? No, right? But it's a combination of these things. And of course, as we learn the peaceful solution, then we're able to see, you know, uh, we and our students were there, we're able to see and associate why certain behaviors took place in our lives, why we made certain choices that we made when we were younger or as we got older, uh, understanding uh, the environment and the influences and and peer pressure and the desire to fit in or uh, maybe not appreciating our own self-worth and so forth. You know, all these are are factors and keys that that, uh, play a part in the decisions that we make and ultimately the person that we become. Now, as we covered in the first chapter, and, and as we move forward here, but, but keep this in mind because sometimes people might feel like they are continuously in a rut, right? I think, uh, you know, we've probably been in that situation, most of us, where it seems like, you know, it might be a day, it might be a week, or it might be a month or whatever. It just seems like uh, sometimes it seems like it's a year or two, you know, when we're, we're in that kind of feel like that, that rut, that mental rut. Well, young people go through this too, right? Where it feels like there is just... There's just no escape. I keep making bad choices. You know, nothing goes right for me and so forth. Well, you know, it's just one grain of sand in the sands of time. And, of course, the goal is to get them to understand that, all right, acknowledge what's taking place, try to go back to the source or the cause of it, and then make better decisions in the future. You know, sitting there, and we looked at the example of the little pig wallering in the mire, you know, you know, not beating yourself up over, over a bad choice, right? We all make bad choices or wrong choices, and most of the time it's because of a lack of education. It's a lack of knowing what the consequence of that bad choice could bring about in our lives. Um, uh, but, but, um, um, but when they understand that and they have purpose, and remember these are the things we covered in the in the first unit and the second unit and so forth, uh, especially unit uh, two and acceptance about purposes and goals, you know, I would encourage you occasionally, you know, to go back and and reread that. That's important for all of us, especially as adults. We can't lose sight of our purposes and our goals. Uh, I know those of you who are joining us uh, online and and locally here, uh, it's evident that one of your goals is to uh, not only become a better person, but to help other people become better. I mean, that's what a teacher does. Remember, a teacher is also someone who role models positive behavior traits, positive character traits, and so forth. And, uh, and that fits right along with the purpose of what is to bring, be brought forth through character education here. So, you know, keep these things in mind and, um, and uh, kind of always have them on the forefront of your, of your uh, mind as teachers. You know, you're going to have difficult days. You're going to have tough times. You're going to have situations where, as we talked about, uh, they will test your resolve to develop a positive character. But if you, if you have your goals and your purposes always in your mind there, and, and remember, it's our job to role model these things to our students, right? It's nothing wrong with telling your students, you know, I want to become the best example of, of a peacemaker, a best exam- the best example of what we're learning here in this peaceful solution to everyone that I encounter. Now, they're going to hold you to that. (laughs) You know, if you tell them that, they're going to hold you to that. And if they see you getting a little bit, you know, uh, angry at something or, you know, losing, losing self-control, they're going to, they're going to quickly remind you, I thought you were supposed to want to be the best teacher, you know, (laughs) and so forth, you know, so, but there's nothing wrong about, uh, you know, with being accountable for your actions, right? There's nothing wrong with even sometimes sharing your, your positive goals with others, because you never know, someone might have the same goal or you might be an inspiration to somebody who would like to do something of that nature. Well, let's look on page 23. Now, this is some um, additional reading activities about um, this was, uh, of course, you have enrichment activities that come after every lesson that you can go back and, and, um, uh, and go over. In fact, page 22, um, 
It says there, uh, write an essay about what respect means to you and make an acronym about the uh, word respect. And then uh, these are some of the activities that can take place. You can give to your, children, your students to assign them um, to enhance the lessons even more. Also, number three, read the article, Another Homeless Death, on page 22 and discuss how disrespect was shown. And uh, do the Just for Fun activity on page 23. And so that's on page 22, 23, and then 24. Um, we won't go over the crossword puzzle right now. All right, so let's look over to Lesson Plan 2, page A. Lesson Plan 2, page A. And this is where we get into Chapter 2, uh, Respect for Myself. Um, and this is, of course, the note to the teacher. And, and this is where we should pay very close attention to this because even though as teachers we're instructing our students, it's also important that we be instructed as well, right? Um, and so this is where we get the foundation of what our job is as the teacher. What This is a little kind of before. It's kind of more like a, like a letter, you know, a note or a letter to the teacher, like, hey, this is the purpose and the goal of this uh, of this lesson, and this is what we see taking place in society. This is what we want to accomplish in our students, so read this. So this is um, entitled Note to the Teacher, and this is the, the chapter two, Respect for Myself. So we lay the foundation in chapter one of what respect is, how it looks, how it affects society, a little bit about how disrespect looks and how it affects society, the environment around us and ripples outward and so forth. Now, with that foundation being laid, because you can't get into understanding respect for yourself if you don't even have the foundation of what respect is to begin with, okay? So it might seem kind of like we're kind of going back and forth, but we're really not, right? We had to lay that foundation first, and then as we move forward, you'll see how it all ties in as all the seven chapters of each unit is, um, is laid out. So it says, someone once said, if we are to achieve real peace in the world, we shall have to begin with our children. Does anybody remember who said that? That's right, Mahatma Gandhi, right? Um, I didn't go to high school with him. Uh, he was long before my time. But he was somebody that's actually mentioned in The Peaceful Solution who is, uh, you know, he had some great ideas about um, peace, right? He didn't have everything, but he did have great, uh, you could tell he was, taught and brought up in certain values and, and morals and so forth, and he pushed for trying to bring about change within his country, right, within his own community, uh, without using violence. And there are many people who have pushed to bring about change, or as it's called, social change, change within a society, a collection of groups, and uh, a collection of people, a group of people with the shared values, likes, interests, and, you know, they live by a shared uh, set of rules and so forth, uh, but to make it better, <coughs> you know, to make it better for society. You're thinking about not just us right now, when I, as an adult and as a parent, uh, think about the things that I can do to uh, impact my society, the world around me, uh, my nation, my city, my town, my neighborhood, whatever it is, I think not only of me, but also of future generations, not just my children, but children who will grow up and have to be an adult uh, in that world. Every generation who comes after us is left with what that previous, the decisions of that previous generation. You know, whether it's financial, I, I just heard on the, um, the news today that uh, with, I don't know if it's in a few hours or by tomorrow, the United States will reach its debt ceiling, right? It'll reach its debt ceiling. So we've got a certain amount of time to do what? Raise the debt ceiling. <laughs> That's, that, that was the exact next words out of the, the uh, news broadcaster's mouth, you know, that, you know, they have to decide on raising the debt ceiling. You know, not stopping the spending or lowering the debt. Let's raise the debt. Now imagine if all of us were able to do the very things that, that we see taking place uh, in not just the United States, but many, many governments. Oh, man, you know, you're, you're kind of maxed out on your credit card. Well, just raise the limit on it. You know, just give me more money. Now I'm only at 50% credit utilization, not, not, not 99 anymore. But when we think about this now, it's a little bit different for us to see as, as um, you know, being educated in the peaceful solution and understanding right choices and understanding how those choices uh, affect 
ourselves, affect our economy, you know, affect uh, other nations, nations that we have to trade with, nations that rely on our currency and how our currency affects the value of their currency and their greats and their, their products and so forth. Um, you know, and, and the Peaceful Solution covers that, too. It gets into, I uh, guess, what you could call fiscal responsibility, right, financial responsibility, teaching a person how to be accountable for the decisions that they make, not only in regards to just, well, I'm not going to steal or I'm, you know, I'm going to say, you know, uh, nice things about this person, but how they, how they handle their resources, right? Um, you, you see a lot of people who are in the world who or in society, I guess I should say, who, um, you know, they play a, a $2 uh, scratch off or, uh, you know, they hit the hit the lottery. I think somebody recently just won the $1.3 billion uh, Mega Millions lottery, you know. And, and, it, and if you ever get an opportunity, you know, um, this would be a great opportunity to show to your students on why, you know, and I say this because a lot of young people think that the goal or the, the key to success or a measure of success is being rich, having a lot of money, okay? And, and this is what's put in the minds of the people. Look, you know, they watch stuff on MTV. They see things on YouTube. They see, you know, people, you know, standing in flashy car in front of flashy cars, you know, flipping $100 bills, not knowing that it's probably fake, not knowing that the cars are probably rented. There's people who actually make money renting out their houses, their cars, and so forth, to people who want to make videos about being wealthy, right? Um, but that's what they think. They think that that's the measure of success. But there are videos out there that show people who have actually, you know, come into big windfalls of money suddenly, you know, through lottery or sometimes maybe even inheritance, like an overnight millionaire or tens or hundreds of millionaires. And, you know, those people were more broke afterwards than they were. They were in more debt after they got millions and millions of dollars in worse shape and in, in greater misery, more depression, you know, all the friends that they gained, you know, all of a sudden, you know, they all dispersed very quickly, you know, after all the money was gone. And a lot of them have said, now, not everyone, some of them are a little, you know, they're, they're responsible. And, but the majority of them were saying, you know, I would that I would have never won that money, right? Uh, because Money doesn't change your character, right? It doesn't, it doesn't all of a sudden you, 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 you have $10 million in the bank. That doesn't make you a more responsible person. I think about it, I think of it as like, you know, um, you know getting a bigger space, right? You have a, a little storage building and you fill that storage building up with uh, junk or storage. And then you get a bigger storage building and you're like, man, man, what am I going to do with all this space? And a year later, man. I can't see anything in here. It's so packed with junk, right? The more space you have, the more money you have, the more things there are to spend it on. Well, without, uh, you know, character education, a sound moral character that will enable you to make right choices and to stop and think, not make impulsive decisions, not make decisions that you don't think about the consequences later, you'll be in worse shape after whatever the case might be, in that case, a big windfall than you would before. <laughs> so someone once said, if we are to achieve real peace in the world, we shall have to begin with our children. And, and that is very true, you know, because children, uh, they set the pace, they set the tone for the next generation, and of course, the respond and will be eventually responsible for the direction of our society. For many reasons, for many reasons, um, oh yeah, okay. True peace does not exist. <coughs> True peace does not exist within our world today. Um, if uh, I have a, a slide in there, slide number two, um, it, I, I actually forgot to take the change the title of it. The um, it's not supposed to be effort; it's supposed to be true. So I apologize about that. It's supposed to be true. The definition of the word true. Um, and if you look at that there, it says the word definition of the word true. As we're talking about for many reasons, true peace does not exist within our world today. And the definition there is in accordance with fact or reality. Okay, true peace. Uh, true peace or peace that is in accordance with fact or reality. Now, remember what William talked about in regards to true and false facts. Uh, you can have a false peace 
kind of like a, uh, you know, a, a, a false uh, feeling of security, right? Like when people go out and they carry, a, you know, a, um, a taser with them, but they're going hiking in Alaska where there's grizzly bears, right? <laughs> they got a false sense of security, you know? I don't think the bear's going to say, don't tase me, bro. I think he's going to go ahead and have a meal, you know? Um, but it has to be in accordance with facts, right? Facts that actually will bring about peace when they're put into practice. And number, now that's a verb there. Now the second definition under it's an adjective and it means uh, bring and it gives the parentheses there. It could be an object, a wheel or other construction into the exact shape, alignment or position. All right. Yeah. Now you probably heard that. You want to make sure that 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 uh, that particular uh, those tools or that alignment of could be a, a bearing or anything like that. You want to make sure it's true. Right. In other words, that it's it's exactly where it's supposed to be. It's exactly in the, the in the per position, you know, the prescribed or calculated or engineered position. It's like uh, when you look at uh, if you've ever looked at. Um, uh, well, it could be any mechanical thing, but, you know, some things have a lot tighter tolerances, but like a like a jet engine. Right. They have very tight tolerances. And when they take those things apart and they put those things back together, you know, they have to make sure that each component is true. It has to be in the exact position that it was engineered to be because you're talking about something that's spinning at thousands of RPMs per minute. Okay. And if something's out of alignment, that 36,000 feet in the air, right? Triple A, you don't send tow trucks, you know, <laughs> at, uh, uh, five miles high. And something can go wrong very quickly. Well, we're talking about peace. So if the components of peace, which are based on facts, are not in existence, where? In the minds and the hearts of the people. Because peace comes about through people. Through people interacting with one another. So if they don't have the truth of how to be peaceful, how to teach peace, how to, you know, be an example of peace to other, then you're not going to have this. And this is why it doesn't exist in our world. This is why education is so important. We've got a lot of education in the world, no doubt. But education and positive moral character is, is uh, vastly lacking. So it says, our children are suffering. And as parents and educators, we suffer with them, right? And, and that's kind of a twofold statement in, in regards to our children are suffering because they're suffering as victims, but they're also suffering as perpetrators. And when I say suffering as perpetrators, that is, it's easy to look at a child, a young person, and they usually... You know, the U.S. government, the CDC, Justice Department, you know, all these different organizations, they look at, they kind of classify children uh, in their most demographics between the ages of, and I, and I mean, when I say this, I'm saying people who are at a point in their life where they're a little more accountable for their decisions. Uh, between the ages of uh, 14 and uh, 19 or 14 and 25, okay? Um, but, uh, but they also can be the perpetrators, right? They could also be the causers of uh, violence and crime and, the, and peace being taken out of society. This is why we have juvenile delinquency. You know, they call them kitty jails, right? They call it because uh, young people are making bad choices. Why? Because they're not educated. They haven't been given the facts that will enable them to be a part of bringing true peace within a society, even if that society is down on the smaller scale and called a home or a family. Many young people take peace out of the family continuously, right? Um, if you look at the next slide there, and this was uh, from the justice.gov, it says, what percentage of children are victims of violence? And so we see it on one side of the coin here. It says 60%, think about this, 60% of American children, just in the United States, right? It's a, it's a big world out there. But just taking a look at the United States of America, 60% of American children were exposed to violence, crime, or abuse in their homes, schools, and communities. 60%, over half. That's what's reported. You know, I would dare say the number is much higher because a lot of these crimes don't go reported. They don't, they go underreported, in fact. 
And so the statistics are not um, as accurate, but they're pretty close, I'm sure, at the very least. It says almost 40% of American children were direct victims of two or more violent acts. And one in 10 were victims of violence five or more <gasps> times. Children are more likely to be exposed to violence and crime than adults, okay? And they're very impressionable. They're very susceptible. Um, and a lot of times their, their voice kind of goes unheard, right? Their, their voice is um, kind of muffled because, again, these things have to be reported. And a lot of times they're threatened. They're told, don't you say anything, right, or this is going to occur, or you'll be taken out of here, or you have to go live here, or you're not going to have home. And so there's a, a threat placed upon their head, so they're afraid to say anything to anybody. So they, as we talked about in, in regards to in, in, um, uh, the self-control unit, uh, chapter 3, in dealing with anger, right? Uh, in dealing with anger, you have uh, withdrawal, internalization, and displacement, right? Internalizing and displacement. So these young people, they go through the same things. Because they're having a conflict that's taking place in their life, and it probably is a trigger for anger in some way, shape, or form. And they will act out in one of three of those ways. They'll internalize it, which, you know, if you've ever seen uh, taking a balloon or anything like that, and you uh, continue to fill it with air or a tire, you know, and you go off and you do something else, well, that tire has kind of stretching limits. <laughs> you know, it has a, a capacity. And little people, young people, they have a only a certain amount of capacity to take things. They're not really designed and educated to take, you know, the, the, the hardships and the psychological abuse that comes from uh, adults, sometimes parents, guardians, or, uh, bullies at school, and sadly, sometimes even, even the teachers, people who are supposed to be responsible for them. And so eventually, they kind of pop, right? And it comes out in some way. You know, sometimes it might just be shouting. Sometimes it might be, you know, throwing a tantrum or something like that. Sometimes, as we read, they go into actually hurting themselves. Um, you know, they cut themselves. Sometimes they burn themselves. Uh, sometimes they'll actually go through with the whole thing and, and, and commit suicide. Uh, you know, these are things that take place on a regular basis. Uh, or they will displace these behaviors or these feelings on other people or things. So... It says here, as it continues, our children are suffering, and as parents and educators, we are suffering with them. Well, let me see here. Do I want to? Yeah, let's look at the next, um, the next slide there, because it's the cost of uh, the cost of youth crimes. It says thousands of people experience youth violence every day. Youth violence negatively impacts youth in all communities: urban, suburban, rural, and tribal. Youth violence is common. One in five high school students reported being bullied on school property in the past year. Now, that's reported, which means it's probably more like three or four, possibly even five in five high school students have been bullied, but they're not reporting it. Why? Because they're too afraid. They don't want to be considered a rat or a snitch or a tattletale or whatever the case might be. Um, the third point there says youth violence kills and injuries. Uh, it says, homicide is the third leading cause of death for young people ages 10 through 24. Each day, approximately 12 young people are victims of homicide, and almost 1,400 are treated in emergency departments for non-fatal assault-related injuries. Approximately 10 young people are victims of homicide every day. Uh, youth violence is costly. Youth homicides for non-fatal physical assault-related injuries resulted in an estimated $18.2 billion annually in combined medical and lost productivity alone. Now, that is just in regards to violence. There's a lot of other things that are taking place in regards to crimes that are committed by youth that are non-violent, but it's still cost, as we're going to see in a little bit here. It says the impact, last point there, <clears throat> of youth violence is not the same uh, for all young people in communities. The rates and types of youth violence vary across communities and across subgroups of youth. These disparities can be attributed to different exposure, <coughs> excuse me, different exposure to risk and protective factors. Now, I'll insert there that 
that that risk, those exposure to risk and protective factors, I would say primarily comes in the form of education, okay? Uh, different exposures to certain levels of education that would teach them to be a contributing, positive, productive member of society or teach them to be a, uh, engaged in risk-taking behavior that jeopardizes their health and safety and, of course, the lives of them and other people. As we saw, 12 people, 12 youth each day are victims of homicide. Let's take a look at the, um, it's uh, video one, which I think is the only one there. And we're going to just take a look real quick at uh, what, how youth, crimes are affecting just one community, just one. Local retail expert says theft and shoplifting appear to be on the rise, and the suspects are younger than you might think. Jen Boniza has more. Crime decreased across the board during the pandemic. Now that life is almost back to normal, crime rates, especially for juveniles, are on the rise again. People are returning to their everyday lives now that pandemic shutdowns and store closures are behind us. But that means crime is also increasing. According to HPD's crime statistics, juvenile arrests dipped in 2020. The 2021 statistics aren't in yet, but a retail industry expert says it's clear theft is on the rise again. So once the stores opened, we started to see a lot of grab and goes, a um, lot of people shoplifting, a lot of the same suspects coming back into the stores again um, and, and lifting things. And it's sad. And she says many of the criminals are younger than you'd think. Everybody thinks people who are shoplifting, they're adults, and that's not really the case. What we're seeing with organized retail crime is we've seen kids that are as young as in elementary to intermediate school. According to police, on March 15th, a 15-year-old boy attempted to steal more than $27,000 in jewelry from a store at a popular shopping center. There was a theft that happened at one of the stores at White Kelly, and there was a lot of jewelry that was stolen. And my understanding is the suspect has been apprehended. Yamaki says she's happy that Honolulu's prosecutor seems more willing to prosecute these types of cases. Now it's up to judges to ensure the penalty fits the crime. Because she says without adequate consequences, juvenile offenders are likely to re-offend. Places like the YMCA have intervention programs to help steer at-risk youth in the right direction. We provide programs in the high schools and middle schools across the island. And uh, we do intervention, prevention, as well as treatment for substance abuse, along with uh, outreach to at-risk youth in the schools. He says it's a safe, supervised place for teens to hang out after school, during breaks, and summertime. I think that's where kids are most at risk to get in trouble, is during those times where they're not supervised. Jen Boniza, k one 2 News, working for Hawaii. Now, I don't know about you, but I would like the opportunity to go and teach those fine people down in Hawaii, personally. Uh, about the Peaceful Solution <laughs> Character Education Program. <laughs> if given the opportunity, any volunteers want to go? <laughs> All right. But, um, but as you can see there, you know, that, that these are crimes, these are major crimes that are being committed by young people, right? It's not just older people that are, that are doing these things. $27,000 in jewelry stolen. Uh, you, know, the, you know, that cost, that cost of the community um, in, in loss and productivity, and, you know, they have to recover, they have to make an insurance claim on it, or whatever the case might be. And, of course, you know, uh, creating stronger laws and greater punishments for, you know, these types of crimes that are committed, you know, they, as Grandma used to say, bless their hearts, you know, it's not the solution. Uh, the solution is educating them, right? To keep them from doing the same things that they're doing, you have to educate them or habilitate them so that they can understand the consequences of their choices. First off, as we're covering in here, in Chapter 2, they've got to have respect for themselves. If they don't understand or have respect for themselves, then they're not going to have respect for other people or, other, or the belongings, the possessions, the property of other people or the environment. I want you to just think about something here because in that definition, I kind of meant to bring this out. I skipped it over a little bit. <clears throat> Under um, uh, the second uh, definition of um, uh, bring into shape or alignment, you know, it kind of made me think about, um, about what we're learning in the peaceful solution, shape or, or an alignment or a position. 
right? And, and what, of course, we're shaping or aligning is our minds and our character with the information that's being presented here. Just for your notes on um, page four of the character unit, this is unit one, it talks about character, everyone has it, but uh, where does it come from? In the very first paragraph, at the very bottom of that paragraph, it says, um, well, if we look in the middle there, it says, in fact, our character is an integral part of who we are. Whether the character we have is positive or negative depends upon many factors. These factors include genetics, family values, influences, experiences, choices, and environments. Uh, environment. Um, you know, I always try to, I like to kind of memorize those six points because those are, those are keys to understanding the things, the factors that make up our character. Together, they help mold and shape our character. They help build our character. They put our character into a certain position, whether it's a positive or a negative one. If you look down, well, you probably don't have your book, but um, uh, that second paragraph, uh, the second to last sentence, it says, uh, it talks about behavioral traits and, and physical traits and so forth. It says, um, these are called fixed traits because once determined physically, uh, like eye and skin color and things of that nature, um, because once determined genetically, your environment cannot change uh, them. On the other hand, how your character and personality develop is not only based on her your heredity, but also on your environment. And that's what we covered in the first chapter there, or the first uh, paragraph there. And in the third uh, paragraph there, last sentence, it says, the important point to remember, though, is that your character and personality are not fixed like your skin and eye color. Character and personality can change and develop as you experience and learn new things. Now, it's kind of open right there because you can experience and learn, learn bad things. You can experience and learn negative things, and your character can start shifting in the wrong direction, right? So it could be either positive or negative things. Of course, the goal is positive, but they have, we have to be aware of that, okay? Um, also in the... Um, Chapter 5 of the uh, character unit on page 105 in regards to building a character. Uh, this, I'm just tying this in with the definition of, of true because we're talking about true peace. And in order to have true peace, you have to build or align or position people's minds with the goal of developing a positive character. And this is under the ripple effect character society and the world. And it's under the uh, heading introduction. It says, our character dictates our behavior and our actions. And this is why we don't have true peace. The reason we don't have true peace, true peace is the result. Um, a society of, of violence, high crime, uh, poverty, those are symptoms. Those are not the causes. Those are the symptoms of other factors. Okay? And these, are, these go right back to the decisions, the collective decisions, and then we, we're not generalizing everyone and saying everyone's making bad decisions or some people just don't care or everyone doesn't care or no one has respect. No one has respect for the community. This is why our community is run down and, and boarded up and, you know, graffiti off. No, that's not the case, all right? But <clears throat> sadly in our society, you know, the majority kind of wins out. When you have a great majority of people who have that mentality, then yeah, it's going to affect the impact of society in a, in a negative way until someone you know, starts to redirect the focus and the thought of the community in a positive way. And a lot of people have done that. They've taken initiatives to clean up their, their neighborhood. They've started like neighborhood watch programs, you know, crime stoppers and things like that to try to prevent crimes and report certain things. They're, you know, initiatives to kind of clean up the environment, you know, paint the graffiti, paint over the graffiti on the, on the walls, you know, and sometimes even get the guys who, who do the graffiti, get them out into do murals or things that would build up the community, you know, help the community look great. Okay, you got a great skill. Now, some of these uh, tag artists, they're, they're pretty darn talented, right? But they're trespassing on other people's property, right? They're vandalizing. Now, they don't have permission to do it. Now, if they get permission, they can use that skill to do something positive. And we've seen many things like that take place. And it gives them an outlet, but it's in a positive way. It's with permission, and it doesn't decrease the value of the environment that they're, or the neighborhood. So it says, um, there, are, there are very few activities that we do on a daily basis. I'm back uh, reading off of page 105 on the, in the character unit. Um, on the daily basis in which we are not directly interacting with someone. And those interactions are going to bring about a sense of peace or a sense of, you know, 
not necessarily war, eventually it could lead to war, but you know, take away the, that individual's peace. When a group of people live under a common body of laws um, and share common values and interests, they are called a society. In the same way character shapes an individual, it can also shape society. So this is why, for many reasons, true peace does not exist within our world. Now you can think about it from the standpoint of a global society, right? Um, so when people who live, um, oh, let me, let me go back and read this here. In the same way character shapes an individual, it can also shape a society which in terms forms a nation or, you know, the international community, however big you want to get, okay? But it's all made up of people and their character and the decisions that they make. So when you have a majority of people who do not adhere to certain rules or guidelines or principles, as we learned in the first chapter of the character unit, moral principles, they did, they're a line that separates right from wrong, then you don't have true peace because they're not upholding those, those values. They're not upholding those principles. They have not valued them themselves more than likely because they have not been taught to value them. And that's where your job comes in. In essence, character can shape our world. A choice, either positive or negative, starts with one person, but can affect not only that person, but also a family, society, and even the entire world. So for us, right, we can see that, um, that it's more than just, you know, what you see taking place on the news. It's a little bit deeper because we understand, you know, why the society is in the state that it's made, that it is. It's like... Um, I think about it like a like a a path or a rut, right in in a in, in the forest or on the grass or whatever. And if one person one time walks down that that cross that grass or through the woods or whatever, probably wouldn't do anything. You know, there's just maybe a couple of blades of grass will fall down. Eventually, they'll stand back up in the light, right? But imagine ten people walking down that, then thirty then 100, then 10,000, eventually you're going to wear out a path, right? And that wearing out that path shows the direction of the path, you know, the direction that everybody walks back and forth. Well, it's the same thing with choices. Right? You might think, well, if one person makes a choice, yes, it can affect them. Yes, it can, it can potentially affect a lot of people around them. Like when one person decides to, you know, blow up the Oklahoma, you know, uh, building, uh, that could affect a lot of people, <laughs> you know, but um, but that's an extreme uh, case of one person's decision. But what about when a thousand people, or twenty thousand, or several million people choose not to value, um, have the value and respect for other people, or the value and respect, uh, value respecting other people and their belonging, or other people's. Um, uh, choices, right? Or the environment. What occurs when you have 20 million people or, or 100 million people who follow that same path? Well, eventually all society is going to be affected by that, right? So the more people who continue to make negative choices or engage in negative behaviors, the farther out those ripples are going to spread and probably the bigger those waves are going to be. Well, it can be the same in a positive direction too, right? It could be positive ripple effects that take place. So it says here, going back to uh, Lesson Plan 2, page A, we cannot be there to protect our children at all times. We're still at the uh, top paragraph there, <clears throat> about middle. We cannot be there to protect our children at all times. So we need to instill, we need to instill in them a sense of worth. By doing so, we can give them the skills to make moral, respectful choices to cope in a disrespectful society. And that's what, what I've always said is, you know, having the ability, you know, or getting your child to, to a point where they value themselves um, and the choices, making positive choices uh, greater than the peer pressure, uh, than the desire to fit in, then they're less likely to succumb engaging in risk-taking behaviors because they have value for themselves. You're going to think about, well, if I do this because my friends are 
you know, they're, urged, they're egging me on, you know, oh, come on, come on, just take a drink. You know, just come out, just come on, take it. We're just going to do a little drinking and go to the beach, right? That's never a great idea, you know? <laughs> do a little drinking and, and you know, d- you know d- go, go for a drive down to the park, right? A person who values themselves and understands that they have a purpose and understand that they have goals and keeps those things in the forefront of their mind, they're going to stop and think, well, you know, what could take place? You know, can any great thing take place, come out of a bunch of drunk friends in an automobile? <laughs> Probably not, you know? And so they'll stop and they'll think about those things because mom or dad's not going to be standing right there behind them the whole time saying, oh, no, don't make this choice, son, or make sure you make this choice, daughter. No, you have to instill that within your children. You have to instill that within your students to get them to the point where they value themselves and others enough to uphold the moral principles even when no one's around them. Remember, the true test of self-control is what you're doing when no one is looking, okay? On that note there, um, having uh, getting them to have this self-worth in the uh, character unit, lesson plan three, page A, and this is a note to the teacher at the very last paragraph, at the almost last sentence. It says, hence, we must also teach our children well, let's uh, back it up here. It says, we live in a culture where our children's role models are sports players, singers, and movie stars. Remember, these all fall into the classification of uh, influences as well. This would not be an issue. Notice, this would not be an issue if these role models live exemplary, exemplary lives. But where positive character is lacking, it poses a threat to the moral development of our children. Hence, we, it's our responsibility as teachers must teach our children how to choose positive role models and what behaviors are worth imitating, right? Because they're going to see these things. You're not always going to be able to shield your children's eyes, you know, like parents used to do when a certain scene came on the movie. They put their hands over their child's eyes and the child would look this way and look that way, you know. You can't always shield their eyes because you're not with them all the time. A a parent doesn't sit at school with their child uh, when they're in class or when they're out on a field trip or when they're walking back, you know, and forth uh, from home to school or whatever the case might be. But when you train them, when you teach them, when you get them to understand that there are certain things worth imitating and other things, just cast it aside. And and help them to understand why if they take those characteristics unto themselves or engage or practice those same behaviors, how it's going to hurt them, right? I mean, we as teachers, we can show many examples of, just probably pulling things from the things we've experienced, or even there's a lot that's even online that can show how people's lives just went downhill with a series of bad choices, but it all started with one choice, right? And it just continually spiraled downhill. And some of these people were living the quote-unquote high life. They were sports players. They were movie stars. They were singers. You know, they had everything that they felt that that life could have to offer. Uh, You know, women and and cars and big houses and a bank account full of cash and you know friends galore right and the popularity and the and the fame but they suffered they suffered because of their choices right uh wealth does not shield you from bad choices you know some people might say well a great lawyer does but but i mean those bad choices follow you everywhere you go So it says here, let us work together to ensure that our children appreciate that the true measure of self-worth, okay, this is what we're talking, we want to get our children to have this this sense of worth. It's up to us as teachers to instill this sense of worth, aka what we're reading here, self-worth within themselves. Uh, The true measure of self-worth and importance is attained through positive positive character, not how many likes you have on your, you know, social media page or or friends that you have on a social media page, or how many people are your friends. No, it's through the development of a positive character. All right, so let's see here. Um, By doing so, instilling in them the sense of self-worth, we can give them the skills to make moral, respectful choices to cope in a disrespectful society. Yes, society is very disrespectful right now, uh, and it doesn't mean that everybody's out there cursing, cursing everybody out. No, it doesn't necessarily mean that. But it's disrespectful because people have not been trained to have care, consideration, and concern for themselves, others, and the environment. 
Now this lesson, respect for myself, will focus primarily on the importance of acquiring self-respect. If you go back or just make your note there, I just made a little line over there and went back to uh, uh, drew a, or writ, wrote page three there because that gives us uh, the definition of respect. Um, it's the beginning of the chapter, chapter one, value of respect, and it's in the second paragraph. It says, in this unit of the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program, you will learn how to develop the positive character trait of respect. Respect means to recognize the value of people and things and to treat them with... Now, I've always, when we went to um, uh, different schools and so forth or, or done presentations with teachers, uh, I kind of simplified it because uh, I like to simplify things, put them in a nice little bag that you can carry, and you can carry a whole bunch of little bags with you, then you can just you know, a whole bunch of big ones. You can get fit more and kind of condense it and just call it the three C's or triple C's in regards to the definition of and remembering the definition of the word um, or the character trait, respect, okay? And you see here, it's to recognize the value of people and things and to treat them with consideration, care, and concern. So if you kind of remember that, the three C's, Consideration, care, and concern. Consideration, care, and concern. Consideration, care, and concern. And that gives you the definition of what it means to have respect or to show respect. All right, so we go back there and we see that there. Acquiring self-respect, which means having consideration, care, and concern for who? Ourselves. For one's self. And this is an essential part of, um, of positive moral character development. And it, consequently... It will also lead to true peace, okay? Because in the first paragraph, we just uncovered the fact there's no true peace, right? Now, we just talked about why there is no true peace. We know that the actions of a society all began with the thoughts. Thoughts that were placed in the mind of the society from many, many years of teaching, uh, environment, um, choices, influences, right values all these things went into the the minds of every single individual they everyone had these things placed into their minds as a as a young person and they led to the development of their character children children often devalue their own worth <clears throat> excuse me as human beings and this lack of self -re respect sometimes results in choices that leads to risk-taking behavior. All right. Now, sometimes why they devalue themselves, let's see here, here we go, is because they don't see the importance of themselves, right? They don't see the importance in themselves. Uh, remember, value is something that's important and worthwhile, right? If it's worthwhile, it's important to you, you're going to take care of it. You're going to take care of, uh, see to it, maintain it, make sure it's in great working order. Well, that includes yourself your hygiene, your appearances, your health, uh, your mind, by, by feeding it and putting in positive things that are going to build your mind instead of tearing it down. Um, if you think about this road less traveled here, uh, or, or think about these values and the, the things that get lead people to engaging in risk-taking behavior on the, the page two of the character unit under the road less traveled, near the bottom it says, so along with keeping up your appearances, you must keep working to develop positive, a positive moral, justifiable character. In order to avoid these bad, bad scenes that were talked about previously on page one, um, you have to start building a positive character and start making choices that are decided ahead of time and are consistently responsible, respectful, honest, and that is just to name a few. Now, without that, it leads to what we just read to right here, a lack of self-respect, that leads to risk-taking behaviors. So you kind of see the, the, the huge burden, so to speak, or responsibility is a better word, that we as teachers, you know, have in regards to kind of shaping and molding not just the mind, but the thinking process that takes place within the mind of our students. And this is the purpose of this chapter, to get them to understand and to see and have respect for themselves. The latest report from the book by uh, uh, the book Teen Sex by Julie K. Endersby, Endersby uh, states 
Quote, the AIDS virus is practically common among young people. One-fifth of all people in the, people in the United States have AIDS, um, who have AIDS, excuse me, are in their 20s. Now, this is what she's saying here, that one-fifth of all people in the United States who have AIDS are in their 20s. Now, remember, it takes a while for this viral load to kind of build up and develop. And this is where she continues on. She says, these people were most likely infected with HIV in their teens, all right, HIV in their teens. And it was interesting because it was, I don't know, everything seems like it was just a few months ago, but some of this stuff has been like two or three years. But um, but I was uh, looking at a report because it was some, I don't remember who the name, it wouldn't really matter what their name was, but it was some popular, some Hollywood star. Um, I think that, I think they were a socialite, in other words, you know, being around a lot of very, very famous people. Um, and they had been for like over um, over five to ten years, right? And then it came out publicly that that person was HIV positive. And it said that in the article that it, it likely was that they acquired it when they were, I think it was like 16 or 18 years old, and they were in their, their mid-late 20s at that time. Now, at this point, they had been around and probably been engaging in a lot of sexual activities with a lot of people. Now, and, and those people were with a lot of other people and those people were with a lot of other people. So you can see how these, the, the consequences of engaging in these risk-taking behaviors can start to spread very rapidly within a society because people don't value themselves. They don't know how to value themselves. They don't understand that they have value. So what's the big deal? You know, it's just a body. It's just a life. It's just a dollar. It's just a person, whatever the case might be. And they engage in things and they uh, engage in impulsive behaviors, not thinking about the consequences. So it says here, they, <clears throat> they were most likely infected with HIV in their teens. And so it, we continue in the Peaceful Solution, it says, um, or, or her, her comment here, it says, teaching children to value, this is from that book Teen Sex there, teaching children to value themselves will give them the ability to preserve their health, safety, and well-being. And that's, you know, that's a, that's a, a reward of you know, learning, being educated, and moral principles, and putting those things into practice. For some students, this might be the first time they receive any information on how to develop respect for themselves. This is basic groundwork that is necessary for success in their lives. And then we're going to see um, some of the other topics that are going to be covered in this lesson are um, the power of optimistic thinking, uh, the importance of having positive internal language, and of course the the next teacher will go into more detail about these things, um, and specific skills for replacing negative self-talk. And that negative self-talk, that is an excellent topic. Um, I can't wait to get into that. Uh, lastly, it says, our, suge our suggestion is to pay attention to the needs of the students as teachers. This is what we're supposed to be doing, emphasizing and reiterating we're necessary to ensure that students in the lesson with the firm understanding of how to develop and improve their self-respect. And as we read here, this is probably the first time some might even be receiving this. So it's not just a matter of improving, it might be the initiation of self-respect for them. So I do uh, stop there on lesson plan two, page A, and the next teacher will probably go over that last part there. Um, the next teacher uh, will be, uh, it'll be William or, 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 uh, or David, but uh, our class will be uh, the 22nd. Uh, 5.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Again, we do thank you, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the very next class. Have a wonderful day, everyone.